From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. We're tripping through time a bit today because we are recording the intro to an interview that we conducted a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. That's true. It's an interview with Amy Westervelt, and we'll be introducing her here in a little bit. She makes a podcast called Drilled, Mm -hmm. and the whole first season of that show covers basically the story of how climate change denial became a thing, like the birth of it. Yes, Amy is an award-winning host, journalist, and producer of several podcasts, several different projects. And Drilled is a true crime style podcast about the forces that worked to create what we call climate change denial in the modern day. And Amy was kind enough to have us on a soon-to-be-released episode of Drilled where we talk about how how to talk about hot-button issues without being too particularly divisive about it, something that I think we excel at here on Stuff They Don't Want You to Know. Tell us we're wrong. Or let us know we're right or just leave a review on iTunes. We'll accept it. I was more saying come at me, bro. I think we do a good job with this stuff. Uh, I would agree. (laughs) Uh, For now, let's get into it with Amy Westervelt. Amy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. We, we couldn't be more excited to have you on. You also founded an entire podcast network. Is that correct? I did. Yeah. I, um, I don't know what I was thinking. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Huh. We, <laughs> I sort of like I was helping so many different um, people make their shows that it seemed like a good idea to, to bring it all together. And then somehow I like that sort of led me to say yes to way too many shows. And now we're sort of, you know, we're kind of finding our, our path and, and sticking with a a sort of core group of about half a dozen shows that we're working on at various points during the year, Although that's including a, the one that I report in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And to, to that end, Drilled is uh, one of the bigger shows on your network. And it yeah. is um, it is fascinating and, and at some times infuriating to listen to, um, not because of uh, your hosting or anything like that, but just because of the content that you're tackling within it. So before we get into, you know, climate change denial overall, let's talk a little bit about just climate change in general and how it's evolved over the the course of, you know, first studying CO2 levels Mm. within ice. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Real quickly, let's uh, differentiate. We were talking about this off air. Uh, This is something I had heard years and years ago from someone that I hope was uh, attempting to be funny. Uh, They said, yes, I believe in climate change because if you drive from Miami to Manitoba, the climate changes. And I had to stop. (laughs) Full disclosure, this was at a Thanksgiving dinner, and I had to stop and say, that's not the kind of climate change we're talking about. That's not what people mean. Instead, we're talking about a a global or regional change in climate patterns uh, parent, especially from the mid to late 20th century to the present day, uh, attributed largely to a specific cause, the increased levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide, CO2, produced by fossil fuels. Is that correct? Correct. I mean, there's, it's, you know, it's also a few other greenhouse gases, but that's the primary thing that we're talking about is the human contributions to atmospheric change. So first things first, then, what is the number one, if, if you had to choose one, what is the number one fact, statistic, or piece of information about climate change that everyone listening to this episode needs to know right now? The thing that always kind of blows my mind and tends to to do the same for other people is that, you know, we kind of think about this as something that started with the Industrial Revolution and has like continued 
at a sort of steady pace since then. But there's a, a thing that scientists call the great acceleration. And really, in just the last 20 to 30 years, which are also, you know, the years during which scientists increasingly knew more about the impacts of emissions, there's been a ra- like a really rapid increase. It's something like 50% of all emissions ever, ever have been released just in the last three decades. Um, and so there is this real... I don't know, this this need, I think, for people to understand that, you know, it's people alive today that have been <laughs> pretty key contributors to the problem. But equally, you know, we could act just sort of just as radically in the opposite direction in the same amount of time. I wanted to ask you about one of the earlier, there were the earliest good measurements of CO2 um, that are found within both, uh, let's build, Early on, it was ice where CO2 yeah. was measured. So let, mm-hmm. let's talk about something that's called the Keeling Curve and some of that yeah. research that was done in the 1950s. What is that? Yeah. So Charles Keeling was uh, an atmospheric scientist. He took measurements in um, a few different places, mostly the poles, um, but also Hawaii. He spent a lot of time in Hawaii. He took measurements of atmospheric CO2, and he took them over long periods of time. And he uh, was able to sort of strip out what was human and what was you know, what would have sort of naturally been there from things like fires and um, volcanoes, for example, in Hawaii. And so he he plotted this graph to show, okay, look, there's this curve upwards where we're seeing an increase in human CO2 emissions. And if we start to, if we continue to see this, there are things that we know it will likely trigger. And honestly, like, I mean, it goes back to like the late 1800s in terms of when scientists started to figure out what excess CO2 would do to the atmosphere. So it's not like, it's not new science, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, Keeling was just able to better sort of differentiate natural CO2 from human CO2. And then actually carrying on from him, it was Exxon that did the next kind of batch of research, and they uh, measured CO2 in the oceans because there was a, a thought during the 60s and kind of into the 70s that it was it's kind of like, oh, it's okay if there's more atmospheric carbon because the oceans act as a carbon sink. So there was an interest in understanding, you know, how exactly oceans absorb carbon and um, where and how they release carbon. So that was work that Exxon was undertaking in the 70s, mostly around South America. Let's talk a little bit about Exxon in the 70s. Yes. Because this this show often, on Stuff They Don't Want You to Know, we apply uh, investigative attempts or critical thinking to things that uh, are portrayed as conspiracy theories or, or fringe theories. And I think one thing that will startle a lot of people is that ExxonMobil participated in something that could – very fairly be called a conspiracy uh, for some time because, as you said, they they figured out some of this stuff already, uh, some uh, CO2-related science back in the 70s, kind of spearheaded by a guy named James Black, right, the Mm ExxonMobil climate scientist. What did they find and how did they handle this? Uh, did they did they go transparent with it? Did they secrete it away? Uh, wh- what did they do with the knowledge they gleaned? So they it was it's really interesting. Like there's been there's been a few different sort of narratives around this, but from I've I've now spoken with probably six different scientists who were there at the time, including a guy who was on the boat that was taking these ocean measurements and was very involved in in that work. And as near as I can tell, they they, you know, they did have quite a bit of information about CO2 emissions and how they impacted the atmosphere. And they, you know, they made predictions in the 70s that we're seeing come true today. There, you know, when we just we just had a moment maybe last month where we hit a particular concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And it was like bang on what Exxon scientists predicted in the 70s. <laughs> so, um, and, and even like within the exact time frame that they predicted. So um, they were doing a ton of climate modeling and they um, there were several internal reports where their scientists were saying like – 
there's going to be a point in the next 10 years where we have to, you know, James Black says this in a, in a memo. He says, in the next five to 10 years, we are going to have to make some hard decisions about energy sources to avoid catastrophic climate change. You know, in, in like 77, there's letters to President Carter about it. Um, you know, and then uh, you just sort of start to see a little bit less of the research being done, definitely less of it being shared, and more research being done into all the other possible drivers of climate change. So Mm. this is a very, this is a thing that lots of um, companies that don't necessarily want their product to be, you know, the the focal point of a of research. <laughs> do the tobacco companies did it? Lots of other companies have done it too. They look for what are all the other causes, and they fund science into things like what impact do volcanoes have on climate change? What impact do sunspots have on climate change? Or all livestock those kinds of things. Yeah. Or livestock, right? Yeah. So they continue to fund climate science, right? It's very clever. (laughs) But it's all in the service of kind of moving attention away from fossil fuels as like the sole or the biggest culprit. And they also start to fund a lot of um, more sort of pie in the sky, long range. Uh, solutions technology too. So this is another thing that you'll see and you still see it today is like a ton of funding on things that sound great, but are extremely theoretical and will take at least 20 years to work because it just buys that much more time at, you know, the status quo. The story on Exxon has been kind of one of like, oh, they were doing all this great stuff and then they turned and it's all greed and da, da, da. And, And personally, I think that it's more a question of strategy. Like there was someone in charge who initially thought that being part of the research would get them a seat at the table and help them, you know, have a a voice in the sort of uh, crafting of a regulatory framework. And then at a certain point, there was a, a realization that like, oh, this is really going to affect how we do business. And the better strategy is just to sort of put that off for a while. And you definitely, you sort of start to see that shift in the late 80s and early 90s. So one thing we do know for a fact contributes to this climate change is industry and the energy infrastructure. And there's a new study that just came out, I think on July 1st, from Nature and the International Journal of Science that says, that. Yeah, yeah, so committed mm-hmm. emissions from existing energy projects, planned energy projects on the book uh, could bring us to 1.5 Celsius climate target by I can't I can't quite tell what the target date would be but it is including all of these things that are already planned that are in progress so I assume right. I think probably by like 20 Gosh, it's usually I'll, 2050 is yep, what they yep, say. Exactly. Those, no, it's yeah. 2033 is actually what it has here. Oh, wow. I see. Yeah, wow. so even sooner. Yeah. So what does that mean? What would a 1.5 degree Celsius change in atmospheric conditions actually functionally mean for us as human beings living on this planet? You know, it's a little bit um, – it's scary to me that like – 1.5 is quickly, you know, it was sort of the goal for a long time and it's quickly starting to feel like the floor, like that's the minimum we're <laughs> going to see and we'll be lucky if we can keep it at two. But um, we will see a lot more of these these big storms and big fires that we've been seeing. And um, we may see that the jury's still out on this a little bit um, around the melting of, of the Arctic ice sheet. If that happens, this is the thing that I think a lot of people don't understand about climate change is that it's not just like this thing happens, then that thing happens. A lot of these things are sort of like catastrophe multipliers, you know? So like if the ice sheet goes, that's a whole cascade of other things that will go. You lose permafrost, which has a lot of like ancient viruses trapped in it, for example. So like, hello, anthrax. Um, you you have uh, massive sea level rise, which then not only makes certain places uninhabitable, but also makes storm surge that much more of a problem when we do get big storms. Then you have like, you know, a massive storm that... Um, drives people out of their homes. They're sort of having to find places to live. We're already, they're already uh, predicting tens of millions of just domestic climate um, migrants within 
particular countries, the U.S. is one. Um, that's another thing I don't think we really hear that much about. It's like you think of, oh, okay, sure, there will be people that – um, have to leave like island countries and go somewhere else. Well, we're seeing people have to leave places within the U.S. and migrate somewhere else. And I think we've seen in recent years how well the world is equipped to deal with large scale migration. <laughs> um, right. You know, it's not not great. So, um, yeah, I mean, all of all of those things, and and it's really this sort of like cascade of of things of like multiple catastrophic events happening either at the same time or shortly like shortly after each other so you just don't have that kind of recovery time in between and then the other thing too is um you know high levels of co2 in the atmosphere are not great for our brains um so you do start there's some research that's coming out around loss of iq level over time and developmental issues mm-hmm. over time and things like that too so it's really it's hitting on a lot of fronts, and I think that's why, you know, people keep talking about the need to um, talk about climate change as it intersects with all these other kind of policies and um, kind of governmental concerns because it is – it's not sort of this separate thing over here that just affects the environment. It's like it's going to impact how people live day to day. Yeah, that's an excellent point, and it's one that should be frightening to a lot of our audience members. Uh, I do have to say I I love how you went through uh, very quickly, very, very efficiently some of the concerns that that we had found that aren't, as you said, widely discussed in this conversation. You know, the you named island nations like the Maldives, Vanuatu, and others like the Solomon Islands uh, that that have had public statements from their governments saying we are literally in danger of going under the waves. Mm -hmm. And with this cascade or this aggregate domino effect that we're talking about from one problem leading to a next, uh, I've seen some some pretty pretty, uh, shocking scenarios, you know, like just planned out or their estimates based on experts' guesses of how this mass migration, both domestic and internationally, could actually drive governments away from addressing the problems of climate change as they, you know, as they um, foment nationalism or whatever to to fight yeah. what they see as the other invading. How much of the substance of those do you think is accurate? I understand there's got to be some guesstimating there, but are we as a species in a situation where this is possible, where this is plausible, or where this is at this point in 2019 unavoidable? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, this is a thing that I think it's it's scary for people, but I think good for people to understand is that um, what I just described is is kind of the best case scenario. Uh, like that's if we don't develop any further fossil fuels. You know, this study that just came out today is is like calculating the stuff that's already been drilled or is being drilled or is under development. There's a bunch more that's planned. Uh, the U.S. is increasing production right now. Global emissions are going up. So, you know, at this time when scientists have said, we need to have been on a path to zero emissions, like yesterday, emissions are going up. So we're going in the opposite direction. So the idea that there's there's much chance that we won't at least hit 1.5 is pretty slim, And the other thing that I think is important for people to understand is that it can get worse. Like we've talked a lot about 1.5 and then, oh, two degrees. That's like really bad. It it could be three or four. So it's not like just because we've already kind of committed ourselves to a certain amount of of warming and the effects of that, that we should just say, well, f*** it. (laughs) Like, let's, let's burn it all. Um, cause it can become much worse than that, like, that new sort of scenario could last a lot longer. What we're looking at now is, okay, if we can keep it to 1.5, then yes, we'll have more catastrophic events. Yes, we'll have migration to deal with, but we can start to bring the atmosphere back in balance and we can start to, 
um, see improvement of those things over time too. You know, there are technologies that are looking at harvesting CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, and I think there's a lot of like optimism around those. I'm not sure how, how well that's been earned <laughs> right now. The only thing that absorbs CO2 is trees and we're cutting them down. So there is some hope that like, you know, on top of just reducing emissions, we could, turn back the clock and remove emissions from the atmosphere if we if we can get, you know, enough money into geoengineering and carbon capture and these kinds of things. But um but we have pretty much, you know, there's a a, a generation of folks that have committed the world to a certain amount of this no matter what. And we'll continue our conversation with Amy Westervelt after a brief word from our sponsors. <laughs> And we're back with more from Amy Westervelt. Okay, so let's get into the whole, like, what, what is the point? Like, to what end are people denying this stuff when you can literally see the effects of it firsthand? I mean, I joke yeah. all the time about how it's so much hotter in Georgia this summer than it was last year. I was like, but, but climate change is obviously a hoax. And, like, I mean, I'm, you know, like, a little flippant about <laughs> right. it because it's so galling and depressing that people can't wrap their heads around this or choose not to. Like, is it yeah. blissful ignorance? Is it, like, completely agenda driven like what what is the 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 impetus behind this continued denial of something that is supported by so much science and just by common sense opening your damn eyes yeah so i think you know the good news is that the the real like hardcore kind of old school it's not happening denial has definitely dropped off i think it's like maybe 10 to 15% of people which is still a lot of people and you know a surprising number but it's it's fairly low um but there is there are sort of like gradations of it now where it's like now you have a lot of people saying well, it's happening, but I don't know how much humans are contributing to it. And therefore, there's not anything we can do. Um, so there's that kind of flavor of it. There is the, you know, well, it's happening anyway, so we might as well squeeze profit out of it in the meantime, kind of, mm -hmm. you know, take on it. And, you know, it just depends. Like some people, for some people, I think it's it's kind of part of the whole ideology and like tribal identity thing. You know, I, I met a woman uh, recently who has actually signed on to a, a lawsuit against oil companies, but still doesn't, quote unquote, believe in human caused climate change. She's kind of like, you know, ice ages and, you know, volcanoes and whatever. Mm. But for her, um, the way that she was sort of able to kind of maintain her tribal identity, but still in effect, do something about climate change is that um, she just felt like it was really unfair that the oil companies had a bunch of information that they weren't sharing with the public. And mostly the thing that got her was um, that they were uh, doing various things to protect their own assets against climate change at the same time that they were telling everyone else not to worry about it. So she's like, that's just not fair, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> right. If, whether it's humans causing it or it's just a natural thing, like they knew that it was happening and they told everyone else not to worry about it. And that's not fair. Um, there's other folks, actually, um, quite a few libertarian think tanks are coming around to the idea of climate as a public nuisance or climate change as a public nuisance or like a liability issue with respect to private property rights. So this idea that, you know, again, like some companies had information that would impact property value and didn't share it. They're like, that's not right. <laughs> you know? Um, so it just, it, it kind of depends. And, and I think I actually, I don't know. I think that the, um, environmentalists have done themselves something of a disservice and in, in sort of for a long time being really insistent that people have to like buy into every single thing in order to like, you know, be on the same side or like do something about it or whatever. And it's like, hey, if like your thing is private property rights and that's what like pisses you off about emissions going out of control, great. Like, that's cool, whatever, you know? <laughs> and like, I don't need you to believe in all the science or understand it or whatever. It's complicated, you know? And like, um, I think, I don't know, sort of forcing people to um, be able to like argue their case on parts per million is just silly. So yeah, I mean, that's that's the kind of the one 
good thing I've seen in the denial space is this sort of evolution of of people figuring out a way to like remain the same ideologically, but like still act on climate in some way. I mean, that's a positive way to look at it, Amy. So thank you for <laughs> providing that. Um, you know, one of the first episodes we ever made of this show, in fact, I think it was the first episode, was about a man named Edward Bernays, who is a lot of times thought to be the father of, or at least he's, uh, he stated in a lot of places as being the father of public relations. Mm -hmm. And in Drilled, we almost immediately, or very early on at least, get introduced to someone named E. Bruce Harrison. And yeah. can can you tell us a little bit about this? Because I think it speaks to how this, he at least, lend a, he lended a heavy hand into the way that this became such a complicated issue rather than just science that's being reported. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the whole PR complex has had a very integral role in all of this. E. Bruce Harrison was the sort of godfather of greenwashing. Um, he was working for American Cyanamide uh, when Rachel Carson's book Silent Spring came out, and it was a sort of condemnation of the chemical industry and, and mostly just this idea that, like, companies should be able to pollute, you know, the commons and not take into account the impact that that would have on the general public. And his boss, the, the sort of, like, story goes that his boss came in and, and holding that book, like, saying, this is Pearl Harbor for the chemical industry. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, he um, got together with some of the folks at DuPont, and they came up with this whole strategy of, and it's, you know, it's brilliant of like, let's get companies to sign on to, you know, some number of environmental initiatives that they feel comfortable with so that they can at least appear to be like good corporate citizens. And let's bring them, you know, let's bring the environmental organizations to the table and, you know, we can all work together towards something. And he, he's still alive today and he very much feels like he, um, that this was a very positive thing that like, hey, he got companies to talk to environmentalists and agree to do certain things. And, you know, um, but, you know, really it was in the service of being able to continue to pollute without paying for it. Mm -hmm. you know? right. There's another guy too that I just, um, I've been like digging into for a future season who was the, um, the head of PR at Mobile. And he's fascinating because he was like the guy that got them to fund Masterpiece Theater and all these like documentary shows. At one point, he was um, funding so much public television that he was known as like the guy you had to know in the UK if you wanted like your British film or TV show to get on American TV. Um, and he's sort of like... He, I don't know. He did it for so long that he started to sort of fancy himself like a, an actual member of the creative team, you know, <laughs> and like at one point he decides to leave mobile and start his own film production company. And then it's like, you know, he has no film credits after that. <laughs> it's like, mm. oh, sorry, buddy. It really was the money. Um, <laughs> <you know? laughs> But yeah, even that, you know, it was, it's very subtle, you know, it's like they never did any sort of hardcore ads for mobile in those shows or anything. It was just about like affiliating themselves with like, you know, high class culture and like being intelligent and, you know, being a thinking man's company and all these kinds of things that just kind of lay the groundwork for like, Hey, they're not so bad. He was also the guy that worked with the New York times to, um, invent the the op ad which is like a paid yes. for op ed mm -hmm. the advertorial yeah. or whatever it kind of reminds me yeah. of the uh, the keep yeah. america beautiful campaign with the yes. native american gentleman with the single tear who actually yes. was italian he's, i yeah, think yeah he's italian yeah. american and, and the whole thing was uh, funded <laughs> by the can lobby to shift the yep. responsibility from corporations onto humans and saying yes. see this is an admonishment because this is all your fault you made the native american man cry in his canoe um, yeah. and it's literally Give just Shifting the blame that and shifting the, the focus. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally. It's all, yeah, a lot of the anti-littering campaigns were funded by basically packaging companies. 
Wow. <laughs> wow. And this uh, this yeah. is another uh this is another conspiratorial thing that occurs uh more often than people think, right? Because an ad is is hidden almost everywhere you look nowadays. We have though when we talk about the threat of climate change and these cascading effects, we do have a couple of examples of if not corporations, at least state institutions that are making some moves to mitigate uh, the effects of climate change so much as they can, right? Like we Mm -hmm, hear hear a lot about Norway, for instance, or Germany, some other Scandinavian countries as well. Uh, Could you tell us a little bit about the kind of moves those uh, governments are making and, and whether and how successful, if successful, they are going to be? So there are heavy um, investments in renewable energy in several Scandinavian countries. Um, And I think, you know, Sweden is on track for zero emissions, I think, by 2020. But there's also – I hate to be, like, the person who's just such a downer about all of this stuff, but, like – there is this like weird boondoggle thing happening with European emissions commitments where they're um, heavily relying on something called biomass, which I don't know if you guys know what this is, but it's essentially like burning wooden pellets for energy. And right now what's happening is that you have in many cases, like Denmark is a good example, the Netherlands, um, countries basically importing these wood pellets from like America <laughs> and other places in the U in the world and um, and then burning them for energy and it's like it's considered zero emission because the tree eventually regenerates but it's really it's some interesting math um, <laughs> you know it's like well trees don't like immediately grow back there's a certain amount of you know m- tree waste from making paper and various other things, but it's really not that much. It's certainly not enough to fuel these biomass plants. There's no real, like, accounting for the emissions coming out of the burning. And then there's also, like, a a sort of... um, ash that's made that they they actually haven't figured out what to do with yet. A lot of places are just collecting it and, like, putting it in warehouses. Oh, wow. (laughs) And I just... I think, like... We need all sorts of solutions all at once. And honestly, I'm kind of in favor of like throwing as much crap against the wall and seeing what sticks. But like this, there are, there is like a real opportunity for, you know, continued kind of problematic human thinking here too. You know, like we, we are, we have done a, a fairly bad job in many cases of sort of like innovating our way out of these, um, these problems and there is this sort of tendency to be like, oh, we'll just come up with a cool technology that deals with it. And often a, um, an issue with really predicting what the potential impacts of that solution will be. That said, there are things that are happening. There are things like, you know, painting all the roofs white, for example, that um, kind of reflects sun away. Carbon capture is actually a thing that exists. Like the technology exists, it's just very expensive. So figuring out um, how to do that at scale and also, I mean, at scale in terms of the amount of carbon, but sort of at a smaller scale in terms of the actual physical footprint of carbon capture factories in, in essence is a big thing and a lot of countries and companies are trying to do that. Um, that is like a, a big potential fix. There's this thing I've heard a lot about recently, which is um, feeding seaweed to cows, which apparently like dramatically reduces their methane emissions. Yeah, I saw that. (laughs) It's like, how can we MacGyver our way out of this without changing? I know. And then there again with that one, like I'm, I'm so suspicious of these things because I just, I've seen it go you know, badly so many times that I'm like, okay, cool. But I'm like, I I can just almost guarantee you that in two years, we're going to be reading articles about like toxic seaweed poop, you know? (laughs) Uh, That is my favorite thrash metal band, actually. Yeah. (laughs) So not to sound like too much of a hippie, but when it comes to a lot of these discussions, I mean, we kind of do need to look at ourselves as like citizens of the world. And why can't we just all hold hands together and figure this problem out together? And there's obviously an effort 
effort to do that with the, the Paris Climate Agreements and, how, you know, with Trump kind of wanting to pull the United States out of that. How big a deal is that? Is it just kind of like a bad optics kind of thing or is that really a big deal? Like how much difference are these accords going to make even if everyone agrees to them 100 percent? So first of all, none of these accords. So like basically the fossil fuel lobby completely torpedoed the whole global process when they killed Kyoto. That was like the first and still so far only one that was supposed to have any kind of like actual teeth to it. All of the ones since then have really been sort of like... Um, non-binding is the term they throw around. Right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's like, well, it's a non-binding resolution. So, you know, I mean, currently none of the signatories of the Paris Accord are on track to meet their goals. So I think that tells you how effective it is. Um, you know, not to like cast, I know a lot of people who worked really hard to negotiate that um, document. And it is very, very hard to get multiple countries to agree to anything, let alone something that will, you know, at least at first, reduce their GDP. So, I, you know, I applaud the people who spend that amount of time and energy doing it, but I do feel like any kind of a, a global agreement needs to be so much more harsh than anything that's been written in the last 20 years. With actionable consequences, maybe? With actionable consequences, yeah, exactly. And I do feel like... You know, the U.S. pulling out sort of shows the weakness of these agreements, too, that like um, one country can kind of like torpedo the whole effort. So what do you do in that case? And let's pause here for a quick word from our sponsor. I sure hope that last sponsor wasn't Exxon. We're back with more from Amy Westervelt. The other thing, too, that I wanted to just mention is I keep seeing, like, I spent a bunch of time last week with a lot of climate adaptation people who work on things like seawalls and, you know, like redesigning buildings to be more resilient to large storms or fires and things like that. And, you know, they were talking about all of these adaptation measures and also about some of the like tech, like technological advances and things like that. And it just totally got me thinking that I, I, I have almost never hear anyone talking about adaptation in the sense of adapting to just not developing fossil fuels anymore. (laughs) You know, (laughs) like, where's the adaptation plan for that? People will talk about it in the sense of, oh, we can't just turn off the spigot tomorrow. And I'm like, okay, but just as a thought exercise, what if we did? (laughs) Like, (laughs) like, what if we did? What would that look like? Can we like, just at least think about that? You know, um, because we, we'd have to get a new kind of uh, energy that we could burn, and we would just call it car mass, and it would be all of the uh, gasoline automobiles that exist, and we just burn all those, right? It'd just a great. big giant yeah. bonfire. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're already heading towards Mad Max territory anyway. We might as well just, like, yeah. complete the look. Just you know? go mm-hmm. for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I'm talking and referencing a lot of things that occurred in season one of Drilled. You've You've already had a second season, or are you in the second season right now? We've had a second season. We um, The first season is sort of a little bit of like the origin story of climate change denial and, you know, what, what different companies were doing, but also sort of what was happening in the country at that time, politically, economically, all of that stuff, like what, you know, all the factors that sort of came into play. And the second season, we um, followed a group of crab fishermen who became the first industry to sue the fossil fuel industry over climate change. I kind of wanted to just tell like a a much smaller story (laughs) in the second season of like, okay, here's an industry that's been impacted. And um, most of them are quite conservative politically. So it's pretty interesting that they have been kind of pushed to this point where they're, they're just sort of like, this was just really unfair. You know, we have one of the world's most sustainable fisheries. And because of warming waters and the various things that that has done to the marine food web and algae and all these things, like they're being put out of business. Amy, I, w- I want to get that. And you made a really great point there about these these fishermen, these crab fishermen who, you know, tended to be conservative politically. And it gets back to season one where you really make it a point that this was not at all a uh, 
you know, we live in a two-party system. We exist in a two-party system. This was not one side or the other as the science was being developed early on. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody, nobody controlled the messaging about it in that way. It was, you know, if you voted Democratic, it didn't mean you were for or against climate change and or Republican. And you play a clip from 1998 when George H.W. Bush was on the campaign trail and he has a quote. And I wonder, would it be all right if we played the quote you used on our episode right now? Yeah, okay. yeah, go for it. We're just going to play a clip really fast of that. Some say these problems are too big, that it's impossible for an individual or even a nation as great as ours to solve the problem of global warming or the loss of forests or the deterioration of our oceans. My response is simple. It can be done and we must do it. Let's not forget all that we've accomplished all that we've accomplished since America first concentrated its attention on preserving the environment under a Republican administration back in 1970. I think it's important for everyone listening to this, uh, if you are still listening to this and you perhaps still believe uh, or do not believe that climate change is something that is scientifically proven and something that we do need to think about at least in some way or tackle, uh, you know, however we possibly can. Uh, it's really, it's interesting to me to hear George H.W. Bush on the campaign trail speaking about it in that way as a Republican, that we can fix this thing. Yeah, and as a completely mm -hmm. non-controversial issue. <laughs> yeah, and he got elected. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's just... I, I, in some way, it's inspiring to to think that perhaps it doesn't have to be at all such a diametrically opposed thing. But when did it go off the rails so hard? Like that's what I want yeah. to know. When the money got too good. <laughs> yeah, there was a there was a concerted strategic effort in the '90s, you know, late '90s to early 2000s to take. You know, there was this number that that um, like these industry groups were looking at this number that was like you know. Uh, I think it was 60 or 70 percent of Americans felt like we needed to do something about global warming. And they got that, they targeted that number. And within 10 years, I mean, it was less than 50 percent even thought global warming was happening. So, <laughs> you know, it's not, this is like, this is where I get annoyed when people are sort of like, oh, we almost did something, but you know, humans and it's hard to change and <laughs> blah, blah, blah. I'm like, uh, no, there was a concerted effort to manipulate the American public into thinking something other than what the science was telling them. It, like, we have documentation of that. It was paid for heavily. <laughs> like, it was, you know, we have the... the uh, the plan that they that they made, which was very like, OK, first we're going to do this. We're going to like place all these ads in like Rush Limbaugh's show and this show and that show and start to get people thinking about it as like a conservative versus liberal thing. And, you know, it's very it was very intentional in the same way that I feel like, you know, this is why I, I think I make this comparison in, in season one about, um, you know, people kind of talk today as though this like. Russian bot thing is like a totally new animal. And I'm like, eh, like people who with an agenda have been using our um, existing divides to like, you know, get their way forever, like, you know, for for a long time. Absolutely. And e in the, uh, the odd thing is that with the uh, with the ease at which the average person can access information now, uh, you know, or it's it's sort of like when uh, Philip Farnsworth first invented television. People thought, "What an amazing tool for learning!" Right? <laughs> <laughs> and here we are in 2019, yeah. and it, we uh. see we see a similar thing because when we're inundated with information, it becomes much more difficult to parse that information. And that this this all leads us to. Uh, one one of the the biggest questions, and perhaps the one we close the episode with today, which is, I hate to put you on the spot about this, Amy, but what happens now? What happens next? Uh, dear God, what do we do? <laughs> I don't know. I think I do. I do see some optimism in the fact that. Um, politicians are having to answer questions about climate change a lot, and and the recent kind of. Um, survey numbers are showing that the vast majority of Americans 
uh, don't see this as a partisan issue anymore, that people do see it as something that we need to do something about. And that, um, like to my earlier point, that it doesn't, that it's not necessarily required that people believe that it's humans who are causing the problem to want to do something about it. So that's all pretty positive. But honestly, I mean, um, I think, and I think this was pretty clear in the nature study too, there, there needs to be um, a drawdown of, of fossil fuels. And I think that that's unlikely to happen voluntarily. So in my opinion, I think that any government that takes seriously this sort of threat to humans has got to have a plan for how you do that. I'm going to go ahead and predict here that World War III begins when uh, yeah. when some government somewhere tries to take away all our cars. And then World <laughs> yeah. War III begins. And in climate change, yeah. we're saved from climate change, but uh, that old the nuclear holocaust thing, it happens. All right, Matt, we're going to yeah. hold you to that hot take. <laughs> yeah, that's a hot take. We're going to... We're going to bet a round of beers on that. Uh, also, maybe the world's influential politicians and executives who give lip service to these sorts of problems uh, should stop flying internationally to protest the, the problems of emissions. Oh, man. I'm just saying there's there's a difference between, you know, the individual action and the collective action. And sometimes – Sometimes we are taught, depending on where we live in our neck of the global woods, we're taught that our individual actions don't matter or are mathematically very similar to zero, but that's not the case. Uh, Amy, thank you so much for coming on the show today. The podcast is drilled and we have taken a high-level look at uh, the the active, uh, if we want to be cavalier about it, the active shenanigans pulled by ExxonMobil and others uh, to continue kicking the can down the road for future generations. If you like this show, the first two or three episodes of Drilled will be right up your alley because it really does take you through essentially a conspiracy that occurred to convince uh, the American people that climate change is not real or man-made. Not to mention they're like the perfect little kind of digestible nuggets of episodes. They're like 15 minutes a piece. You can binge this whole thing really quickly. The sound design's great. The music's great. The whole thing just, it's really evocative and it really does, you guys do such a great job of telling the story. If you want to hear more amazing stories, uh, you can check out the Critical Frequency Network uh, that we talked about at the top of the show where this uh, podcast lives. And most importantly, we would like to hear your thoughts on climate change. How have you encountered this in your personal life, both both uh, climate change science and efforts to argue for climate change denial? You can tell us about this on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can find us on our group page. Here's where it gets crazy, where you can talk to our favorite part of the show, your fellow listeners. Uh, if you would like to call us, we are one eight three three. S-T-D-W-Y-T-K. That's just stuff they don't want you to know written out uh, as letters, but it's numbers. You'll get it. If you'd like to find us individually on Instagram, um, you can find me at How Now Noel Brown. Ben, I think you're on there as well. The rumors are true. You can find me at Ben Bolin. Uh, and if you say, guys, this is a wonderful terrifying topic and I have a, I have some uh, I have some opinions I have some science I would like to bring to bear but I hate social media we're right there with you you can send us an email directly we are conspiracy at iheartradio.com and usually we'd leave you right there but Amy if anybody wants to reach out to you is there what what's your social how can people get in contact with you yeah, I'm on Twitter at Amy Westervelt, and you can email me at um, amy at criticalfrequency.org. Awesome. And it's A-M-Y, A-M-Y. <laughs> Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.